And we are live. Graham, thank you very much for joining me on this Monday afternoon. I don't think I've ever actually done one of these on a Monday afternoon. So you are the first that I have ever done on a Monday afternoon. So ah, you know, you what are you me? normally doing at this time on a Monday afternoon? Uh, probably tying up a few loose ends of admin at this point of the day, I think. Uh, yeah, looking, checking up my emails, make sure there's nothing I need to get done before I finish. Is there any kind of admin you don't like? All of it. All of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. no I don't, actually, I don't think there's anything. I don't. It depends on the day, doesn't it? This is the thing. It depends on the day. <sighs> days, days hurt more when you know you haven't got the time at the start of the day to do what you need to do in that day. Yeah. If you know you've got the time to do it, it doesn't hurt, does it? Yeah. Well, I um, I had some interesting time management training actually recently, and he got us to do this. Sorry, we should introduce we should introduce you, but let's do that in a minute. Yeah. But he got us to he got us to do this this task where it was write down all of your challenge, current challenges and all of your opportunities, or you know your current urgent tasks and your sort of nice to do things is a better way of describing it. And then he got us to um prioritize those so you know your number one challenge is probably the most important thing you need to do but maybe your number two opportunity is more important than your number two challenge so so you would then sort of mm -hmm. put them in an order but only up to six right and then you essentially give yourself right what's the time what's the amount of time i need in order to get challenge number one off my desk so that it is no longer an issue and if that is all the amount of time that you've got for that day that's the only thing that you do and you only move on to your next biggest thing yeah. when you finish the first one he said you're not allowed to move on until you've finished it and it was an interesting you know his, his argument was don't have six things that you're currently trying to do all at the same time only start one thing and finish it but that's... i think it works in principle but yeah okay so my way of dealing with stuff is <laughs> If someone's already paid you for it, that comes first. Mm. Um, and then if it's a priority in terms of potential work and it's 99.9% .9 sure to happen, yeah, that comes second. And then yeah. anything else is a nicety. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense, right? <laughs> so anyway, let's start again. Graham. Yeah. Would you do me the pleasure of introducing yourself? Okay. Uh, my name's Graham Cove, and uh, I've been on this planet for 52 years. Mm -hmm. And in those 52 years, I have uh, married, had five children. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I have uh, done lots of different types of work. Yes. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Let talk me through that because obviously you are now, you know, you're a social media trainer. You you help people run podcasts. Am I right? Maybe you can describe what you do better than I can. But I, to, I, you've yeah, not, you've I, not, I, haven't I always done that, have you? No. Well, yes, I have, and no, I haven't, because uh, mm. social media wasn't around when I first started. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've always done, if I look back on it, what I have always done is I've facilitated conversations and that's what I do now. So there you go. It's kind of, I've always been interested in communication. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easier for me to talk about the, the, the kind of things that bond things together as opposed yeah. to the abstract differences in them. Um, so I've always in, been interested in communication. I went and did a degree in it even though i didn't actually know what it was about i just thought it sounded cool why? yeah i was going to say why do a degree in it then if you didn't really know what it was about well because as my teenage son uh who's in the house could because uh, some of them are already at university have been to university but the one that's in the house at the moment keeps telling me why should you know what you want to do at 15 and i totally agree with him Completely agree yeah. drives it drives his mum nuts because she thinks she, he should do yeah. um but it, i didn't know <clears throat> i really didn't know what i wanted to go and do a degree in because um well going back a little bit further than that from the age of 14 i was in a band right what kind was, of music um 
it was kind of uh, avant-garde prog rock. Okay. Yeah, with a bit of folk yep. uh, thrown in. Love uh, that. I've never done anything simply. Um, and that was that was fantastic. That was brilliant. That was my entire life mm-hmm. for for a few years. I just mm-hmm. I, I just assumed I'd become a rock star. That was right. That was it. So you that's know. what you wanted to do at fourteen. That's what I what I wanted to do at fourteen. Mm-hmm. Part of me emotionally wanted to become a rock star. Yeah. The other part of me realised that I just had to work hard at school. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was I got reasonable grades, but not naturally. I had to work hard for it. Um, unlike other people I knew who were just clever academically. Yeah. You know. But I but I, I always saw that if you just put the hours in, you'd get mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um so I I knew that I'd do both. But yeah, so careers teachers were useless. They told me. Uh, I think I told them not that I'd be a rock star because I knew that would blow them out of the water. So I told them that I wanted to be a poet. Right. And I did write a lot of poetry at the time as well. And they told me, no, you can't do that because that's not a proper job. Um, So they told me that I should, that really what I meant by that was that I should do publishing. Right. And somewhere in that, because I was really good at all things artistic and, and English and, and everything else, they suggested uh, to my parents that I should go and do a degree in communications. Right. And and I looked at it and I thought, actually, that does look fun because, mm. A, it was miles away from home. Right. Okay. <laughs> which meant that I could actually get away from my sister, who I didn't right. particularly like. Didn't get on with. Uh, no, and uh, it also meant that I could see something different of the world because where I grew up was actually, at the time, it's not now, but it was a small village, quite parochial, and I thought, yeah, I'd go and live in a big, bad city somewhere. Right. Where did and you go to university? I went to Sunderland. Right. Which is, as, is far. as different. Yeah, well, it, it is. It's a long way from Bedfordshire. Mm-hmm um and uh yeah and it was culturally incredibly different and, right. and, and wonderful because of it um but yeah I went because of that and it was it was funny because the degree was rubbish mm-hmm. sorry, oh really sorry Sunderland University that was polytechnic back then it was it was rubbish but uh there were elements of it which were fantastic Mm-hmm. And I met some amazing people that right. completely changed my life. And and whilst I was there, I also discovered that, you know, actually I'm probably best at learning stuff when I'm just doing it. So in my second year, whilst joining another band and uh, and touring, and we, we were signed as well. Oh, really? Yeah. What was the um, name of the band? The Colourful People. Right. There is, there is a. If I turn this board around, there's a black and white photo of us, which is, is quite ironic. Um, I, I might grab it and show you it before. Yeah, do if you can. If you can get to it easily, do. Yeah, yeah, no, I can. Um, but you are doing that. I also, um, I got a job. I lied and I got a job in a local radio station. Right. What and, did you have? What was the lie you had to tell in order to get the job? Can you well, say? I had to tell. I had to say, and, and kids don't do this now. Yeah, it's very, know. very bad. It's bad. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really bad. Um, <laughs> but it worked. Um, I said, I said that I could edit, which I couldn't. But I was hoping, which happened, that someone would teach me and that right. it would all be all right. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. So it was right. great. Um, but I landed a job in a radio station as well. And so in my second year, they they noticed that I had a flair for uh, journalism and, and they asked me whether I'd like to do a diploma in broadcast journalism. So I did wow. that at a local college, stroke the radio station, whilst touring, whilst doing my degree. Oh, my goodness. Nothing so I like had two hours away. sleep a night. For I a was going to say amazing okay so so that's like you know end of teens early 20s presumably yeah. yeah so then what what once you got your degree then what happened then i 
uh, did bits and pieces for radio. I was I was right. uh, a volunteer for the Festival Radio Association, which used to go around festivals and uh, teach young people how to do radio, which was wonderful. And we had people involved in that, like John Holmes, who went on to write for uh, Radio 4, uh, and we used to get in a lot of trouble together. And um, and Simon Mayo and people like that right. as well. So that was that was great. Um, and I went home, and I <clears throat> I started a business, which was something I'd also done when I was eleven. Right. Because um, you know I can't see the point of just sitting around waiting for someone to employ you. Yeah. So right? what what was the business? So that that business was a business called uh, Subsway. Right. which was a which was a band management business okay. and so i i managed a couple of i found some local bands that mm -hmm. uh that were good but needed management and i started helping them out and i could do right. most of that work at night right and then i got bored during the day so i started selling what were you selling paper what at, just paper Actual like printing paper, paper. This, this stuff that you 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 know, write on and print on and and why and paper? Else. Well, because my dad was a paper merchant by trade, okay. and right. so I'd grown up with paper. I kind of knew one size of paper from another, and yeah. you know what the difference between 180 micron and 280 micron was, and all of that yeah. sort of malarkey. So, um, yeah, started selling paper, and um, in the end, that led to me moving across country again from bedfordshire down to somerset which is where i am now right uh to to work initially for six months for a office supplies company and then buy them <laughs> oh really yeah so you bought the business at that point yeah so that would have been what in your early 20s yeah i okay. bought a, and i bought a little flat down here for about I think it was about twenty one and a half thousand. Was it? Oh, well, back in the day. Back in the day when you now. could actually do that. Yeah. Know? Right? When people could actually afford to buy houses. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. When when you could put down a deposit that was that was sensible. You yeah. Know, not half your life. Yeah. Um, and I moved. And then I married. And uh the rest is history, is to say. And uh, you know, I I I was with that business for about 10 years uh right. developed a completely different line within that business which was the ergonomics line i because right. i get i won't say that i get bored very easily but i get bored very easily and um <laughs> i don't, just you know it, I, tipex is great i love tipex yeah. and uh, i love gel pens and all yeah. of that but it's boring yeah um there's only so many Oh, bottles of Tipex and gel pens you can so look many, at, isn't there? Really? Oh, many, only so many times you can have a conversation about the size of fax rolls with somebody. I can't imagine there's much demand for Tipex anymore, though. Oh, it's huge. Do people still use it? Yeah, arts and crafts. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, painting on balloons. I don't know. Maybe it's. A... But I, 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 the the, the study of uh, how people are affected by you know how they sit all day long etc but that mm. that became quite interesting to me mm. um so i went back to school a little bit again i went off and did some uh courses and and some basic qualifications in ergonomics right. etc and you know that kind of started a whole other line um and then you know we got that business to a point where i sold it and right. uh and then i got two penny to cross uh with that business and then decided yeah. no i don't don't like working for somebody else so i'll set mm. up another business again right and what's the, and what was the business that you set up after that uh workplace adjustments so it was effectively doing all of the service bit of right. the, kind the ergonomics of the ergonomics and the assessment bit but without selling anything so it was going into businesses and advising them on the yeah. changes that needed to be made to pe the way people were sitting at their desks. Basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, right. So that, that was great. Um, and of course, you know, I did that and ha had a uh, lot of success with that. But then, you know, with, within that got bored. Um, mm. So 
<laughs> it's a common theme here. How so, long did you last in that one? Uh, well, I I did that for about I did that for five and a half years, right. and um, and then <clears throat> I got offered an opportunity because right. I I'd, I'd gone back again. I went back to school. Um, Having worked out, as I say, that, you know, I've worked out that I wasn't really academic, but I was mm -hmm. better at sort of learning stuff now that I was Practical, actually interested in yeah. it. Yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd sat some qualifications in specific learning difficulties and other things right. as well along the way and got trained up on assistive technology. And uh, the opportunity came along to, to go and join an assistive technology business. Right. You know, because they were like, oh, well, you're quite rounded. You've got all of this experience here, but you, you know, and you can sell and you can do all of yeah. this. But, yeah. um, you know, and we're looking for that kind of person. And I knew the person that was leaving this this business right, as a BDM. So um, I got invited to go and join them as a BDM. And for those people that wouldn't know what a BDM is, what is a BDM? Uh, so it's meant to be a business development manager. I could probably think of another acronym for it, but I'll keep <laughs> is it. Is it clean? Is no, it... <laughs> probably not. So I'll keep it. I'll keep it to, to business development management. Um, <laughs> uh, and it is only you know it's only quarter past four. If, yeah, it's, bit, it's before the watershed. If, if yeah. the watershed's even a thing, but <laughs> yeah. So that was great, and I, I, I. Uh, I, I toodled off there. <clears throat> that was Newcastle, um, right. so it was a lot of flying. Um, and I was there for about eighteen months before I was invited by another company to go and have a cup of tea with them. Which right. means, in my speak, means let's employ you. Yeah, I would have thought that that would be the yeah. implication. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I've never really done interviews in my life. No, ever. No. I, I just find sort of been presented with an opportunity. I find the whole concept of sitting and you know having an interview for a business pretty bizarre. Really, I think Do you're you like well because I think either you're the right person for the job or you're not. And if you're the right yeah. person, then it's probably about having a conversation, isn't it? Yeah. About well, about the that whole communication thing again, doesn't it? it ultimately, yeah. that's what it's about. It's about is your communication style. Do you have this, the right values? Someone suggested to me actually. They said they said when you're looking for new employees, do the whole sort of traditional interview. But then also, if you think you might want to offer them the role or that you know sort of getting it down to the, the a few candidates, take them for a coffee because it's a much more relaxed environment and therefore they're much more likely to really sort of Open show up. yeah who yeah. they are and yeah. they will start to reveal things about themselves that they've perhaps held back in the interview you know it's not to catch them out it's just actually what are your values what are your motivations you know all that sort I of agree thing. with that I agree yeah with that. and I was like I like that technique yeah because I think you are sort of and you know, also I think <clears throat> not being funny but I, I've sat in a lot of interviews Mm. with a lot of people that are not very good at interviewing and that's yeah that's, well, that's the problem. other thing isn't it yeah are you asking yeah. the right questions that is a massive problem and yeah. you just think half the time you think why on earth are you asking this and and yeah. what 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 is the main objective here what's really? the relevance of these questions yeah, yeah. what's the relevance and you just think and also there's a lot of people that um are just really good at selling themselves yeah. in an interview situation but actually have got no substance to them whatsoever yeah exactly you know? absolutely and vice versa right go yeah. to pieces in interviews but actually are extremely you know well fit you know, they're a great fit for the role but don't get the opportunity to really prove themselves because for whatever what, what would you covered. what do you want I'm, I'm sorry but i always do this i always take over an interview what what is it you want out of someone if you interview them it will always be obviously i want to know that they have the experience and the ability required to do the actual technical work but then i also want to know what their communication style is like what what their values are are that are their values aligned to the business you know because ultimately if if they're not or you know the way that they communicate isn't aligned with how the clients generally communicate it's, yeah. not, it's not going to work 
And also, I think, it, I think it's a mix of lots of things, isn't it? This is the other big one for me, is I want them to challenge me. Really? Yeah. 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 I want Well, I actually want them to challenge not just me, but I want them to challenge what they see of the business right now. Yeah. To come with ideas, you mean. But, you know, if they got, to, like, why, why yeah. are we doing it this way? What about doing th something this? Yeah. Now, I know a lot of people that would argue that that's not what they look for. And mm. actually, because they are the head of the business and they've got very clear ideas about where that business should go, etc. Mm. What they want are, yes, people who are going yeah. to do what, you know, do what the business Don't needs told, them to do. Stay in your lane. Don't yeah. question anything. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I question like whether that. actually that builds a culture that's progressive. And yeah and actually can challenge the world in terms of what it's doing mm. or whether actually you have to find people that are on fire out there yeah. and and sometimes have to tame not tame the beast but sometimes have to find a way of fitting that passion and that creativity and that you know enthusiasm into your culture yeah maybe i had a job actually where i dared to suggest I dared to ask two questions, actually. It was the first one was, why are we doing this this way? Good. And isn't there, you know, couldn't we do it this way? Well, I dared, I shouldn't have even asked the first question, to be honest with you, because I got looked at like I had two heads. You know, it was, oh, my God, how dare you question? We've all, we've just always done it this way. This is how we do it. And I was like, mm, I don't think this is the right place for me because I'm not so arrogant to think that all of my ideas are the best ideas ever and they should all be taken on board and everyone should just do them all but to not even have a space that's open enough for someone to say can I is like is this the most efficient use of time is this the most efficient use of resource you know to not then have an answer that is oh we do it this way because xyz then I would go, okay, that makes sense. Fair enough. I just thought I would, you know, suggest there might be a more efficient way of using people's time and resource. Yeah, to not sort of have that. that I think that's to totally me. fair. And I, I, I actually think that where too many organisations fall down is that mm. they there's not the space to be challenged and there's not the space to fail. Yeah. And you need yeah. both. You need, yeah. You, Ultimately, you need both in an organisation in order for, to, for it to grow. Because otherwise, yeah. you you know, what you're doing, you're probably running the status quo all of the time. Yeah, everything is just a little bit easy and a little bit safe. Yeah. And it's you don't just, necessarily grow in the safe space, right? Not these yeah. days, I wouldn't, no. I wouldn't say. So, I completely agree. And that's kind of really taking me back round to which is nice well done for doing it. thanks um <laughs> yes take me back round to why i'm doing what i'm doing now really yeah so i just got to a point where a it was the right time for me uh in terms of my life mm. um having stepped out of a, a a cro role in a in a an ed tech which you know was exciting um and I was in the journey to help them grow quickly and experientially over a short period of time. And we yeah. did. We really did. Um, but I was I was wanting to really get back into something where I could really work with people and help people again. Right. And the other part of that, which I saw too many people struggling with in terms of marketing was basically I saw so many people just throwing stuff up into the ether. Yes, throw right. it at the wall and hope it sticks. And just hoping it will stick. Mm. Either that or just shouting in an echo chamber, which yeah. is just so common in yeah. so many industries. It's like, yeah. I mean, how many people that may be watching this now on something like LinkedIn are in an industry where – you know, there's kind of an industry standard, if you like, almost mm. for for what kind of content their industry puts out. Yeah. And what happens is that everyone in that industry gathers around it and claps. Yeah. Do you know, they, this is like the legal profession all over. And I think it's it's changed a lot 
for many people on LinkedIn, for example, the legal the legal profession, but there are still lots of law firms who are doing it the old way. You know, they're putting out really boring updates on their business pages and it's like nobody cares. Like in the nicest possible way, there's going to be a really small amount of people who are actually genuinely interested in what you have to say on your business page. People aren't here for that, really. No. You know, and I and think it, I think we're getting better at it as a profession, but I think there's a long way to go. It's it is more difficult for some professions than it is for others mm. because some professions are obviously obviously have to adhere to certain you know regulatory yeah. bodies etc. Yeah. And it's yeah. difficult as to what you can't be can too controversial. Yeah. No. 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 You know. Um, so you, and that's that's another problem mm. I think, which is that. And a, and a lot of people might see that as well, which is that there will be people out there telling you to do these big, bold things on social media. And that won't necessarily work for you either. Yeah. Because, you know, not everybody is going to be able to show their tattoos or get half naked in a bath of baked beans or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and it attracts business. Yeah. Now, if you're so if you're if you're working in social media or you know the arts or, or whatever that's brilliant you can do all yeah. of that because yeah. almost the, the bigger the thing that you do the more eyes on and it's fine yeah I think for me it was more about I didn't want to have to be polarizing in mm. order to be interesting sure. and I yeah and I because I'm because I'm not a particularly polarizing person I'm not particularly controversial I'm quite middle of the road you know I quite like equality you know that everything's sort of balanced with me and I remember saying to someone when I first really properly started out on LinkedIn I feel like I'm supposed to be someone I'm not in order to achieve the success that I want and they were like absolutely not as long as your content is clear and concise and, and people know what they're coming there for, you might not necessarily grow as quickly, but that doesn't mean that you're not just as interesting to be engaged with. So, and I think that was reassuring to me that I didn't need to pretend to be, you know, someone well, with I'll give, I'll give you a very good practical example of, okay. of that, which is uh, the fact that I, for the, four years now every single day i've done a poll every morning have you yeah every single morning every on LinkedIn. day every day on linkedin i've done a poll okay what uh, was this morning's uh oh my gosh now you now you're asking me <laughs> i bet you're a depression now <laughs> yeah and uh and you know what i honestly can't remember uh let me see i'm gonna actually look it up yeah that's that's just dreadful when so you write why? as much as me, yeah, go on. Why do a poll every day? What was the I'll tell you why. That... Let me tell you why. And then then maybe I'll remember. I find it, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the reason that I, I've done a poll every day is because, uh, for a start, I like playing with the psychology behind the poll. Right. It's not, to me, it's a lot of people, it's got, polls have gone through sort of love and hate love and hate on mm. <clears throat> a platform like LinkedIn right mm. and I've but I've maintained all the way along a little bit like yourself really that actually that's a that's actually daft right right and I've said to people that's daft you can't love or hate a poll because a poll is just a mechanism it's no yeah. more of a mechanism than taking a selfie and writing some text or doing a video or whatever it's a, yeah. it's a mechanism for disseminating information mm -hmm. right you yeah. can love or hate the person behind the poll. You can love or hate the content of the poll, but you can't actually hate the poll. Hate yeah. a poll. It's yeah. a poll, right? It's a yeah. semantic differential scale, basically, for anyone yeah. that actually knows their stuff. And that is that is what it is. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting is, when, especially when you do it every day and you do it day in, day out, and you mm -hmm. play with it, is you can get to see how people answer not just what that what they're answering but what's the psychology behind the given answer okay right and and i play with that so sometimes i'll deliberately for example the the poll part of it will be completely abstracted from the text right for to what end like why would you do that to see whether people actually 
are relating the two pieces of information and, and there may be some kind of bridge or whether actually all they're doing is responding to the poll and, the question, not, yeah. and not the question where or whether they do tie the two things together. Yeah. Um, I've also made done things where I've got various people to vote on a particular answer, which is quite obtruse, mm. right? To see whether if I get them to do that, a whole load of people herd in like sheep after that. What, and answer, answer the same thing? And answer the same thing, even though it's the most ridiculous answer. Yeah. Right? And it and it and all of those things work. Interesting. Right? So people... What you think, how you think people are going to answer is maybe got nothing to do with the question. It may just be to do with the herd mentality that you build up around that. So you think that if everyone's answering the say the question the same, mm. that people are reluctant sometimes to stick their head up at the parapet and go, well, actually, I have a different answer to that. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and and you can then see which kind of people are which, yeah. But the main reason I do it is because go back again, going back to what you say is mm -hmm. that actually I could act in true journalistic fashion mm -hmm. with it, which is <clears throat> I don't tend to be polaric. I tend to set out the stall. I right. tend to actually set out the the arguments that are there right yeah in a balanced way and i'll let people get on with it right just kind right. of it's like you drop the bomb and <laughs> let it happen <laughs> yeah i'll stand back and let it go yeah right yeah so there's no need there is absolutely no need for anyone to be this or that because there's plenty of people who are this or will that. do it yeah yeah sometimes yeah. all you need to do is like the touch paper put it in the right yes. place and, let, and yeah. let people go yeah you know and that's that's enough and then yeah. actually what you can do is you can just learn from that overall argument and and work out where the best line is for clients to steer right right interesting because ultimately yeah. what you're trying to do with marketing is trying to reach the biggest picture without upsetting anybody in particular right yeah I mean, you're trying to figure out aren't you what motivates someone to buy yeah the thing that you're offering yeah. so that you can then answer those yeah you know, answer their questions before they've even asked them exactly so that they then go yes you are the right person to for me to buy that thing that i need from you know so they are great it's a great source of starting a conversation mm -hmm. again and uh but over the last the, the business has taken off most and it's really taken off in the last year or so right mainly because the main focus of my attention in terms of material is conversational material and the right. main reason it's taken off i believe is because of things like ai oh really okay so talk to me about that then okay well my belief is and Anybody can write copy. Right. Not everyone can write great copy. Yeah. But anyone can write copy. And mm -hmm. some people can use AI to write reasonable copy. Okay. Because mm -hmm. what they can do is they can use AI, they can manipulate what AI comes up with, and they, they can speed up the process. Right? Yeah. But what you can't, and that all of that means that we now live in a world where you can't actually tell whether someone's being genuine or yeah. not in their output, because actually it could be made, it might not be made, et cetera, yeah. right? So the most genuine output, as far as I'm concerned, that's still out there on any social media platform is what we're doing now. So these kinds of conversations that, yeah, yeah. because be, I don't know what you're going to ask me. Yeah. You don't know what I'm going to ask you. What answer you're going to give. Yeah. No. So ge in genuine form, you're seeing a genuine response. Yeah. From real a, time live. Real time live yeah. from somebody about the way they're, and out of that come their values. Out of that comes mm. their 
authority. Out of that comes their history. Out of that comes everything that would make you want to buy from that person or not yeah. buy from that person. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're either faced with questions, you're either going to come up with something good or you're going to come up with something rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if it's orchestrated and it's, you know, recorded in the studio and everything else, you can prepare for that and you can have yeah. a script in it, but you can't hear. True. That, that's so true. Yeah. And that's why I think this is, and I might be wrong in that, but I, I genuinely The most believe, honest. Yeah. I yeah. think this is the most honest form of showing yourself yeah. on social media. Yeah, and the, yeah, exactly. Because I think to a certain extent, even this, you're on your best behaviour. Like not you, but one is on their best behaviour. Um, yeah. But I think you're right. I think I think you have less time to curate what's what's out there. You know, you don't have time to go back and edit it. You know, it's it's... People have watched well, it already. It's too late. Well, that's right. And and then to talk about the best behaviour bit. The the other thing that al allows me to make content, which perhaps shows the whole gamut of me, is by mm -hmm. making so much of this content across different types of conversation. Right. That then you get a really good picture of who I am. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm on here now today talking to someone about social media, etc. you know, who's from the legal profession. And I'm, I'm obviously talking uh, quite, quite sensibly about all of that. But I also interview pop stars, right. right, and musicians. And some of them are from Ireland and they swear a lot. Yeah. Now, you know, and I might swear back. So the thing is that, if you if you actually then show more of your personality by mm -hmm. showing more different elements of your self in different different kinds of conversation yeah. people can start piecing those things together and go actually that's that's what Graham's about he's actually yeah. quite a multifaceted person he's not yeah. just that he's that and that and that and i get that now yeah it's sort of it's like you think it's clicked suddenly that all of these almost all of this learning that you've done over all of this time particularly in relation to the communication stuff it's almost just suddenly all come together for you and now makes so much sense in terms of what you're now teaching people to do yeah because yeah. I, I just think that you know and the reason that so many people struggle with formulaic ideas about what they should do on social media is mm. because they are not formulaic right well, people think, aren't. People no, aren't by their very nature, are they? This is the thing. Well, yeah. some are. Some are so boring that they really are. But <laughs> a lot of people are. <laughs> a lot of people are are actually very interesting people and have mm. very different aspects and angles to them. Yeah. But also, what they do in their day to day life mm. isn't straightforward either. Right. Yeah. Now, I have a terminology for. Uh, a certain kind of business called orange socks okay what's right. orange socks well basically if you're an orange sock business you have got the easiest time of it on okay. on on any kind of social media or advertising platform because what you do is you sell orange socks right so it's right. very easy what it is what you get how much so you get. niche Low it's, value. yeah it's so like you know it's basically you sell socks different sizes they're all orange men's women's children's whatever if you want socks and you want orange ones this is a great place to go yeah got right? it. that's such an easy message mm -hmm. right but most businesses that i deal with or most people that i deal with their business isn't like that right they've got they've got this element to their business they've got that element to their business they've got this route to market they've got that route to market they've got influencers over here they've got people that maybe take play take some kind of assessment role over here it's, it's so complex yeah that explaining that out on social media Dude, yeah and and getting all of those different stakeholders to understand it isn't as a simple case of going i sell orange socks it's not like it's not as easy so, as that. 
So what do you think about the school of thought then about even if you do have a diverse product range or you know service range to just really talk about one of those because it doesn't mean that people won't buy the other stuff it's just actually your messaging is then clear that this is at least one of the things that we do for you and and talking in depth about that on say your marketing or your social media or whatever uh i think actually if you're if you're cleverer in terms of your strategy you you find the spaces to talk about all of those things mm. right what i will say is be prepared to work right right and and that may be the other place where people fall down which is that they come to some a platform like social media and they say right i am going to give this an hour a week well right. do you know what if you give anything an hour a week it's going to be rubbish mm. yeah. yeah if 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 this is if this is the platform that you're going to use to generate a, a significant amount of your income you're gonna have to work at it and yeah. you're gonna have to put the effort in so you may have to have during a week multiple conversations across multiple channels in multiple different areas now we can get smart with that in terms yeah. of maybe how we disseminate material right and how we edit it and how we put it out there with slightly yeah. different flavor in different places but don't think for one minute that you're just going to get away with you know doing five minutes work and that's going to be enough post and run kind of scenario like, yeah exa exa yeah. exactly you know yeah. you're going to have to show up yeah yeah exactly exactly so so talk to me a little bit about the podcast stuff that you do like how is it that you help businesses do you help them launch podcasts like what is it how does that work yeah um so normally <laughs> it's a bit like the job thing right i normally i normally go i actually normally go to businesses and i normally say uh you should be having conversations about this over there right and and sometimes that takes a long time to convince people. So there's a podcast that uh, got out at the moment. I, he won't mind me mentioning it, um, which is the Guy Osman podcast. Right. And it, I know Guy and I were talking about that for about two and a half years. Really? Before, what about the fact that he was going wanted to launch this podcast? Uh, but about the fact that I've told him he should do it right what's then, his podcast about uh so you, you've caught me right fresh in it because i'm literally just near the end of editing the latest uh for, um edition of it so right. his, his podcast is really about things things that matter in the health and wellness space uh right. in terms of office culture etc and right. and people that are important change makers within that right and so does he interview people uh it's him and uh another lady called kim hutton who's a co-host and then yeah and then they have one guest every time and right. then i kind of sit in the background and listen to the conversation um it's one of the only podcasts where i don't actually get involved and talk right. um apart from sometimes i butt in just if i think someone has missed a question that they should right. be asking um but i typically i normally like we are doing here there's an opportunity for a private chat and i normally like as i'm listening go perhaps you want to ask about this right. um and we just steer the conversation in a particular way right uh, um no it's uh, and it's some of the conversations are brilliant they're just fascinating conversations um i've got podcasts on uh, the accountancy sector i've got right. podcasts on uh, diversity and inclusion i've got podcasts uh i've got obviously my own podcast on music um we've just started the better way of life podcast with marion right. mills um as well co-hosting uh, and we're talking a lot about training because uh that's another business that i'm moving into as well which is uh, train the trainer um, right. as i say i can't stay still no, you got, can't. Got, got, got <laughs> yeah, yeah you've got, got to keep, keep moving. moving. Yeah. Got to keep moving. Um, you know, there's 
I just, I feel probably one of my key strengths is I think I can probably take part in any conversation. Right. I, I like to think I'm fairly well read. I listen to the news. I keep up to date with what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I read around a lot of different subjects, not right. just not just a particular subject. And I, I just think that's... Uh, but also, I have been trained in how to steer a conversation. Yeah, and, and that's another, yeah, and that's another thing I would say is there's plenty of people out there that want to do a podcast, right? But shouldn't. But maybe shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got you've got to have the right ability to steer. Yeah. If you're Absolutely. Gonna... And ask and ask questions that are interesting and that people want to listen to. Right. There's nothing worse than someone banging on for half an hour about. Oh. I mean, for all I know. Right. Hide and speak is the single most boring thing for everyone. And no, you it's know, not. everyone that sees it pop up on LinkedIn, they're like, oh, God, she's here again. Like, can we not <laughs> scroll past that for all I know? Right. But there are some things that I've listened to that I'm just like, oh, God, this is this is painful. And I think sometimes it's just my personal preference. I think quite quickly. So I need things. I need conversation. You need a pace. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And if there isn't, I'm like, oh god, can we like, can we just speed it up a little bit, please? Because like, you're I'm, you're losing me because you're going too slowly. I I think that's something that always uh, puts a smile on my face. Actually, is when, especially when it's quite a heavy subject hmm. type podcast that I'm involved with, is when I when I find the clip from that podcast to put out there as a, as a kind of teaser in and I make it I sometimes my brain is quite good at going for the abstract right and then they're they and people will listen to it and go I would never I never would have thought about that as the clip but actually right. that helps people to be more intrigued about this yeah. conversation than perhaps if we'd gone for like you know that over there which is the office about one. orange socks today <laughs> yeah 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 well the, 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 look the typical one um i'm conscious of the time but the, mm. the typical one would be the, the same with things like newsletters on linkedin yeah. okay i have a newsletter it does really really well right right it's called sausage dogs are cute oh i think i subscribed to that actually there you go yeah yeah right? So are nearly four, and I think people. I subscribe because of the name. Exactly. To be honest. Exactly. But do you know yeah. what? When I was going through newsletters on LinkedIn, and there was mm. a there was a period where they just started up, and everybody was sending you their yeah. newsletter. I was going through the names, and seriously, Catherine, some of the names were like you get legal ones. It's like uh, the the legal generation, or you know, sort <laughs> of like the, the law and its practice. You know, or then you get accounting ones where it's like, oh. you know, uh, the power of spreadsheets or, you know, it's just you just think. Yeah, that just looks dull. Yeah, I'm what? going to call mine not orange socks. <laughs> not orange socks. Yeah, not yeah. Socks. yeah. But, but the thing yeah. is, if, if you if you pick something that's got more of an emotive mm. element to it, right? Yeah. If you're clever at writing, you can segue in your thing to it, right? It might be that you pick something incredibly personal to you so that actually you are telling people something about yourself at the same yeah. time, right? Yeah. We've actually got a sausage dog, so it does right. make sense. He's called Trooper. Yes. I write about him right, in that, but then I bring it round to marketing. Right. Yeah, but, it, that, but the, the thing is that if I look at it from an outsider's point of view, sausage dogs are far more appealing than I am. Is there you know? a photograph of the sausage dog on your newsletter? There is. There's, there's several ones. And that's why everything here um, in Shea Trooperland has got like, you know, there. I do love I've, accent, I've even fair. got, I've even got a pen. Look at this. Working how, the merch. How cool is that? Love it. Yeah. Love it. But that, that's so we, the thing. I just think people need to be more creative. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think the difficulty is some people just aren't. 
aren't naturally creative. I'm not well, particularly naturally creative. Well, that's creative, why people but... pay to, to work with people like me. Well, exactly. This is it, right? This is this is it. I sort of have vague ideas about things, but I can't necessarily get them to the point of... So we can't to... see that from where I am. Gonna... It well, like, it's, it's fine. I've actually got, I've got a way of doing this, which is fine. So this board... Which you you can't actually see. Can't really well. see that well, yeah. So I, I can do this. Oh, there we so, go. Yeah. So you can see the board. Uh, this is the my music board. So all of the people on here are people that have been on uh, the my music podcast, right? Of which there's nearly, I think it's about three hundred and thirty artists now. Wow. From that's cool. Uh, all over the world. Um, and this up the top there, can you see? Is that your band the, up there? Yeah. Can you can you see the guy just about right yeah. at the front? Here, who there? That's me. With no. The long hair. With the long hair, yeah. Yeah. There you go. From what the nineties would that have been? Yeah, from the nineties. The nineties. From, from the from the very the naughty nineties. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. About, about the same sort of time as uh, uh, you know, a lot of other indie bands like Suede and Blur were, you know, yeah, just really getting going. going. I've got a bit of a claim to fame with Oasis, actually. So oh, have you? In, yeah, I'll tell you really quickly. 1996, or was it 95? No, it was the summer of 96. My friends and I, you know, walking through Birmingham City Centre, 15, 16 years old, thinking we're, you know, the bee's this. knees. Yeah. Um, and one of my friends went, oh, he so wants to be Liam Gallagher. So we all turned around and we're like, oh, it is, it Liam, is Gallagher. Liam Gallagher. It is Liam Gallagher. <laughs> So we ended up talking to him. We ended up going to the pub. Next thing you know, a bunch of 16-year-old girls are going to – this was the year of Nebworth, you know, in Loch Lomond. Oh. Ne next thing you know, a bunch of 16-year-old girls have been invited by Oasis to go and watch them rehearse at the NEC for the, the Loch Lomond and Nebworth tour. Um, there's photographs of us in their tour book, and then they gave us free tickets to go to Nebworth. We just had to get ourselves there. Wow. Yeah, honestly, it was just phenomenal. And whenever I talk about it, people go, what the hell? And to be fair, on reflection, Liam Gallagher inviting 15 and 16-year-old girls to a rehearsal was probably not that appropriate. But, you know, we went anyway because we were 15 and 16 and they were at their height in the, you know, 95, 96. But, yeah, so I was – I loved Blur and Suede and Pulp and, yeah. you know, all of those kinds of bands. Like, they were sort of my teenage formative years, really. Well, we've had a, we've had a few of them on uh, the show. Um, I think that the last one I had from that sort of period, I had the Boo Radleys. Do you remember the right? Boo Radleys? Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah. Loved them. Wake Amazing. Up, it's a beautiful it's morning. morning. Oh, God, we're singing. This is bad. <laughs> no, I, I, Let's stop. I get anybody singing. But it's, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. It's lovely. Love it. it's, a, it's a great, it was a great era, really. Amazing. Well, look, we're running out of time, sadly, and I always do like to ask people what are their sort of top tips based on your experience. And, you know, if I was just starting out in social media, what would be the things that you would want someone to know when they were just starting out? Um, yeah, my top tips would be, Look and see what other people are doing that works. Right. Yeah. How do you figure out what works, though? Uh, because you can see engagement on it. Right. Okay. Okay. So you, you can see, and the most important thing for you as a business, if it's from a business perspective, is what are your clients engaging on? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, that might not be That's other true. people in the sector. That might yeah. be that they're all engaging on this over there, mm -hmm. right? So the so the thing is, wherever your clients are, you need to be. Right. Yeah. Because I think that's the mistake that people a lot of people make, isn't it? Like, I you know I might get loads of engagement from other lawyers, but they're not my clients. So that's lovely, but it doesn't mean anything. No. Yeah. So you know, look at what your ideal client base are looking at and if it's a if it's a wide base just try and narrow it for a bit and and go okay be, be more specific and say well maybe geographically I, I want to look at what people in mm. my particular area are looking at or you know uh if if I'm in a particular area of law or something else what are people that 
you might be interested in that looking at and yeah. go to where your clients are yeah put put that thing on yeah. I'll, I'll give a really as a quick end to this i'll give a really great example of how we did that very early on and we're still doing it with wow ergonomics right. which was that you know right at the beginning i looked at the the ergonomic sector and so much of the ergonomic sector were just talking to themselves right, right? and what yeah. we did was uh one of the earliest things we did was we saw the huge uh wave of people that were going into va positions for example working from home you know suffering with backache uh, musculoskeletal issues mm -hmm. etc all all working by themselves at home yeah and we put on a VA event online. Right. Right. And the conversations that we promoted in that, we didn't promote ergonomics per se, because actually, if you'd said to most of the VAs, oh, here's ergonomics, they would have gone, well, what on earth is that? Yeah, so what we did was we looked at what conversations they wanted to have mm. conversations about, and we brought in the experts of those things, and then we tagged along in. Right. And that's the way to do it. Right. Look and see where those conversations are that you're you, the people you want to speak to are and get involved with those conversations somehow. Yeah. Be, be clever about it. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, just I've, don't go barging in and being like, I've arrived to solve yeah. your problems. <laughs> yeah. You all want ergonomic aids. No, I don't. I don't even know what that is. I think we should about ergonomic aids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's no. that's that's my last tip, which is that. People like talking about themselves. Mm, so right? true. So actually, if you're going to start a conversation, start it by listening. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, uh, or asking about that other person. Yeah. Right. If 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 you think about it, engagement is better than most content. And the reason it's better is it's so much better to go up to somebody else's post on something like LinkedIn and go, you know what, you make a really good point there. That's very interesting. And actually, could we talk about that? Right. Because you're showing that person some work. Showing interest, yeah. Mm. Right. So actually, if you don't know what to post at all, don't to begin with. Well, there's Just a school of thought, isn't there? Yeah. That if if actually you're kind of out of ideas, it doesn't mean you still can't engage on other people's content and therefore still get value from being on the platform. There are people that don't really post content at all that are active on on the platforms. Um, it's a platform like LinkedIn. That's mm -hmm. a very high percentage. Yeah, you know, the majority of people are, are lurking out there. Yeah, you know. But yeah. It, so one of my best clients actually was a lurker. I hadn't even, I didn't know he was following me. I didn't know he, in fact, he wasn't even engaging on any of my content. And he's, I think he'd been, he, he'd been following me for about 12 months. And then he sent me a message on LinkedIn going, hi, um, I've been, you know, I've been watching your content for a while. Your last video really resonated. And I think I need your help with something. Um, and he was like, basically, I've been lurking for 12 months and just, you know, have now popped my head up. And he's become one of my best and favorite clients to work with. You see? You know, so it's. People do. A lot of people lurk. You're right. Yeah, it's fine. Well, Graham, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure speaking to you for the last hour. That's if right. people want to get in touch with you, do you still do the ergonomic stuff, did you say? Uh, yeah, we do that every Friday at midday on right. LinkedIn. Um, it's okay. even got its own little microsite, wowergonomics.com. Okay. And then obviously the marketing and social media stuff. So if people want to get in touch with you, what how what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, well, I have a website, which is also the, the website for the, the new podcast. So the, the podcast is called A Better Way of Life. The, 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 the website is called abetterwayoflife.co.uk. If you go there, uh, you can watch previous episodes Brilliant. of the podcast. Uh, you can listen to it on Spotify. And, um, and it also gives you some pricing for social media type thingies as well. It's Amazing. Great. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure, Graham. Thank you.